Yeah, I mean, that, I, that prayer in the morning, <clears throat> part of the morning blessings, um, is very telling. <clears throat> Certainly, its meaning is that the conscious self, self that's talking, is not necessarily is not is not is not the soul itself. Yeah, that seems to be what it's saying there. Um, something really we really need to understand. <laughs> I mean, we all, uh, uh, let's put it this way. We have thoughts that are not in line with the soul, whether they are negative about people, whether they may be related to some forbidden passions, whether they're just, whether they're, they're faith doubt uh, um, thoughts. But clearly those thoughts are not coming from the soul. So, <clears throat> so, you know, either what it's saying is that is the me is the conscious self that's talking, or the me is the combination of three things. And what it's saying is the me is the soul is thank you for for placing this one of three parts in me. Kind of like saying thank you for giving me a heart. And the heart is a component, but it's not the whole thing. It doesn't represent the individual necessarily. Um So what's interesting is that when a person is in prayer, though, you think that the, the, the mind is being dominated by the soul in, that, in those moments, is that's the hope. Um, and yet still the prayer is referring to the soul that you have placed in me. Um, <clears throat> So, I mean, it's a complicated question. I mean, mystically speaking from a Hasidic or mystical Kabbalistic perspective, I mean, there's different levels of soul or spirit. And the word neshama in the Hebrew, which is what he says there, is a high level. It's, it's a more divine level, a very spiritual level. There's lower levels of soul, which give which give life force into the person. So, but the soul that's that's completely, that, that feels divinity and is completely divested of, of physicality is clearly not the self we know, is not, is not us. It, it, there, it's a lower manifestations of, of the soul that, unify with us, not, not the level of neshama or neshama. That level that it's referring to in that prayer is transcends the person. It remains um, <clears throat> so in the so in the Hebrew, I mean I I I'm not I have to think about it, translate it to English, but there's nefesh which is, which is uh, the vivifying soul, ruach, which is the more spiritual reflex. Um, feelings and certain level of thoughts, but feeling related thoughts. And there's neshama is the next level, which reflects talks, which refers to me meditation, its main, Soul power is meditating about God. And above that is beyond reason levels of Chaya and Yechida, which are the ones that are united with God. So even the Shama in most people doesn't, is, is not, you know, integrated into the body. Even though it says you placed it in me, so, you know, maybe to a certain degree it is. But the point is, it's certainly not your conscious mind. But it does it does um, voice its opinion. 
anyway, I don't know if this, what I'm saying is, is super helpful. Um, what I'm trying to say is that there are different levels of soul, different, um, and um, some of those, it's kind of like, like rings and, and the lower rings are more united with the body and the higher rings are transcendent. And then the Shama, I guess you could say is the last level before it's completely, you know, it's, it's very rare that we, we connect with those higher levels. Certainly the conscious self doesn't really, um, because those are above completely super, super rational. So that's from a mystical perspective. Um, maybe from a more, more basic rational perspective. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess I think the way to understand it is that the one talking is the mind and um, the soul is a life force that's put into the person. It's a, the way, we, the way um, medieval thinkers often thought about it would be that the, the life in something is godly. Like the fact that we can move, think, well, everything, I mean, every level, even though there's also the existence level, but particularly the, the moving, the, the element of the gift of life is um, you know is is reflected in the in the soul. In fact, in that way, even animals have a soul. But that, again, that's referred to often as nefesh, the nefesh level. Um, here, we say something that does seem to support the idea that when we say soul here, we're not referring to just uh, a spiritual life force. We're referring to something very divine because we say it's pure. So it, appears, it also appears to me at the end that um, the soul is taken away at night while we sleep, like the one sixtieth, like sleep is one sixtieth of death, and because the last line is restores a soul to a lifeless body, and then it brings it. The soul, the pure, repurified soul, is brought back in the morning when we wake up. Obviously, that it, the soul is not taken away from the person completely at night, but its connection is is um, loosened up, is um, cut a bit. It's, it's not bound to the same extent, and because of that. It's similar to death, but the connection isn't completely severed. While well, when a person dies, the connection is severed completely. And that's why the body, you know, degenerates, um, deteriorates, et cetera. Um, and that has to do with what I was saying before about the idea that the life, the, I, life and the soul are one and the same. And once the life is out, it's just a material you know, piece of flesh there, it's lifeless. Um, so we see both of these concepts here that we're talking about life-giving soul. We're also talking about something very pure, which refers to something divine. So, and this is, so it's the life-giving soul that's in the image of God, which so is both elements. Now, back to your question, let me see if I answered it at all. Um, well, look, what we see here is that the conscious mind, which is the self, because our brain, you know, and the senses together make up who we are, right? I mean, we are our, our, what we, our mind um, making use of the senses is the conscious person. So the soul is, um, you know, something not, it's hidden within that construct, but it's not, um, we don't conscious, we're not consciously aware of it. And so I guess, and so therefore we don't refer to that as ourselves. Does that make any sense? Yes, thank you. 
uh, Timothy has. I'm sorry, Ross. I was just saying Timothy has his hand up next. Okay. Um, Timothy. On that subject, I was reading a book called The Ten Stringed Harp by Rabbi Wolby. And he was talking about when we're in the womb, the soul is not inside the body yet, and it's pure. And then when you're born, when the head starts coming out of the womb, that's when the soul goes into your body, down inside the and becomes like down where your organs and your stomach and stuff is. And, and you, you knew the Torah, you knew all these wonderful things being a spirit. But now when you're born, the Yatshara is added to you. And you no longer remember the Torah that you were taught. <clears throat> and that's why we have the, the mitzvahs to help us protect this, that soul and keep it pure but because of the yats hasara if we sin then it can get inside of us and it can affect the soul and that's why when we die you have to go to purgatory so that it could get purged and cleansed getting ready to go to olam haba so that's kind of how i put it together the, because the part of you that's you that's thinking and talking is the part of us that can do the mitzvahs and and try to protect the soul. But if nobody ever told you that, you don't you don't really know about it. But once you're aware of it, that gives you a pretty good purpose every day when you wake up. But, but that's kind of how I was able to put it together. I don't know if that's correct. That's just from studying and reading, that's how I've been thinking about it. So that sounds great. There's another, there's a couple elements there. Um, first of all, like I said about the onion with the different layers, um, the outer layers of the soul can become contaminated, or you could say it's not really contamination, it's, it's kind of just like, you know, a body can get filth on it, but underneath, it's still intact, right? So, so similarly, the more deeper levels of soul, they remain pure and, and unaffected by, by the person's transgressions. But the outer levels are affected. There's another element, something we spoke about in this book, is that um, the Hasidic uh, Chabad approach is that the purpose for the soul's um, descent is for the purpose of elevating the body, not the other way around, primarily. Although, and then it also talks about the fact how the soul is also elevated by its experience and struggles here. But um, primarily the mission is actually body related, believe it or not. So, so that's another point. But no, definitely we have to protect the soul and that's definitely an important element too. Um, you know, so it's it's both. And like you said, there there is a, a taintedness that can occur, at least on the, the, the outer um, um, the outer I guess sometimes like it's sort of call it a shell. I'm trying to think what how do you call those different uh, anyway, the different uh, levels in the onion. For some reason the word is, is escaped me at the moment, but um, the outer the outer um, levels are are affected. So yes, um, as we said in this and as we're saying in this book. Um, the soul is, uh, the, the Torah and the commandments are natural for the soul and uh, are naturally attracted in that direction. And it's not something that's based on a, on a prior justification. It's not secondary to anything. It's, it's innate and inherent in the soul. It's like, it's like a sixth sense. 
And that's the thing is that reason needs basic values. It's just a way of, it's, a, it's like a tool. Reason is a tool, but without values, it doesn't know which way to turn and, and, and how to utilize its power. And so that's something that's a consistent repeating theme in this book is that intellect needs to be um, subject, subservient to the soul. If not, then what happens is it becomes subject and subservient to the body and its needs. Occasionally there's a place for that. I mean, well, not, you know, indirectly, for example, you know, um, developing various technologies, how to get food, how to make a more comfortable home, and so on, are all, you know, related to values related to the body's comfort and needs, and reason helps a person get there. But, you know, in prime, um, ideally, even those things are secondary to, well, I need to serve God. In other words, they're done for the sake of heaven. And therefore, because I need to, you know, exist and be healthy in order to serve God, so I need to figure out how to provide for myself. That's ideally. So, so the point is, is that, um, that, that the way things should be is that the soul is the compass. Soul, soul points north, points the direction, and reason is then the. Um, the steering mechanism, once we know which way to go. But, but, but reason can't tell us which way to go. And that's part of the problem we have today in modern society is that, um, you know, what are our values? What are, what are the values? I think, you know, they made this some confusion and, but also it's also, um, you know, every few decades, changes at least there's you know there's swings in various directions anyway um let me think of i answered this question so basically the answer to the question is that um the soul senses spiritual things particularly it has a sense uh, of god it, it it knows god's out there it actually experiences God. And um, that's something a person doesn't consciously do. We some consciously do that. Meaning to say there's a sense in us that's, that may often tell us that such and such conduct is inherently good or inherently not good. And that's something that's coming from the soul, even though we don't exactly know where it's coming from. So may I? Yeah. Same, same paragraph. You can tell that I struggle with this one paragraph. I have lots of question marks written all around it. Um, it's so it says, uh, according to Viktor Frankl, and I don't know how authoritative you want to take Viktor Frankl, but his opinion: uh, the soul has intellect and body at its disposal for the tasks and challenges which the person faces in life. So the soul has intellect and body. And I always thought the me, the intellect had a soul and a body. So it's kind of making me rethink the pyramid or the triangle that is me. Um, hmm. Well, the way we experience it is the way you're saying it, actually. That's how we experience it. What, which, what we would like to get to is a place where we experience it as he's saying it. Now, there are moments in time that, or I'll say it differently. Um, when we make choices that heading towards 
um, keeping the seven laws and Torah faith and you're making, you know, and ethical choices. So that's the, that's the soul speaking up basically and leading us in that direction. Um, look at it this way. Um, every thought that you have has some kind of reason for it. It's coming from somewhere. It's seeking some type of goal. So the question is, who are those, who, who is speaking? You know, just the idea of the Yetzirahara, of the evil inclination and the good inclination. When we have a thought, it's generally one or the other. So to think that, that you know, the brain is itself, uh, is at the top of the pyramid, um, would leave us in, a, in well, it just doesn't, it doesn't seem to fit with the reality of that the, brain is is getting is being spoken to from the from inside so to speak and different ideas are coming up to the brain some of them are good some of them aren't and yet at the same time i agree with you that sometimes it seems as if our conscious brain is saying let's do the good let's try to find what's good let's try to find what god wants which seems to imply the brain is heading towards the soul. But in the end of the day, the very basis for us to have such thoughts is coming from the soul. Otherwise we wouldn't have them. In other words, I mean, this is very psychological, but it's, it's kind of counter Freudian or, you know, in other words, the idea that our thinking comes from a selfish place uh, and it comes from basically from our desires or instincts, which some scientists like to say. And we're saying that that's 50% false. That 50% of our, our person's thoughts, or maybe more, but, but the point is that 50% of a person's strength, um, person's made up of the evil inclination and good inclination, or the soul and the divine soul and the more than the materialistic beastly soul or life force. So, so our, 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 our conscious self is actually getting, is there's two different personalities speaking in its ear and we're an amalgamation of those different voices. Some people have more of one than the other and the more we follow the choices, you know, of the divine soul, the more it dominates. So the more good we do, the more that soul dominates and the more that the animal soul or evil inclination is silenced and gets weakened within us, but it's still there, generally speaking. Um, Nancy, is that helpful at all? Yes, just very thought provoking. And, and I like what you said is one way is how we experience it and one way is really the way it really is or. or yeah, right. We experience yeah. it that we're one person. I, this could be very helpful because, um, um, and we really are, but what we're saying is that when we have conflicts, it isn't because we're crazy because we're bipolar or something, every human being is uh, schizophrenic as they used to call it when I was uh, someone who's multiple personalities. Um, although I don't know if that's a real psych psychiatric definition, but in any event, no, we're not uh, schizophrenic. We have different elements in ourselves, And so there's nothing to, in other words, basically, we're not inherently bad, and we're not in we're not exact, not really inherently good either. We have two voices in ourselves, and then we have to make a choice which one to follow. We have 
an advantage towards the good side from one perspective. And that is, at least as Tanya explains it, God helps the good side. So if you have two powers wrestling, but there's someone helping to tip the scale, God helps the divine, the divine soul a little bit um, when we're struggling to make the right choice, hopefully. Um, but I think that's helpful to understand because we, people are full of conflicts and it's very important to understand actually, because if a person has, might have particularly negative thoughts, whatever they may be, a person could often get down and say and feel, wow, what a, what a nasty person I am to have a thought like that. But Judaism comes from it from a different perspective and basically saying, yeah, but that, well, that's the way it's supposed to be. You have two parts of yourself, but you don't have to listen. And the main thing is what your choice is. You are what your choices are, not what voices come into your head. You know, and I think that's extremely important and very much lost today in society where the attitude is, well, this is how I feel. You know, so that's who I am. And basically what Judaism is saying, no, it isn't. You are what your choices are, not how you feel. And um, in fact, the more you go against how you feel when it's wrong and do take the, make the right choice, that's a much bigger reflection of who you actually are than the way you feel. And I think this is really lost uh, on people and, and, and also in terms of marriage choices, this is, this is actually very tough, but less and less people are getting married. And I could say that even with, within communities closer to home. And I think this is part of the problem is that a lot of it, it's very complicated because on the one hand, yes, a person has feelings and it does seem to reflect a very deep part of who we are. But at the same time, I believe that who we really are is who the choices that we make. And actually those choices and the more difficult they are, they will begin and they, they do form us and sculpt us more than anything else. So in a certain way that might explain the exile and the difficulties that people suffer who are good people. You know, again, a lot of these questions that people ask about God and life is because they don't understand. They ask questions with really not having enough knowledge. Understand if they've never sought out the knowledge and the knowledge is, you know, it's like anything else that's precious. It takes a lot of digging and a lot of thinking about. But the point is when a person struggles and has to overcome and has to make sacrifices, then you own it then it's really ingrained on your heart, you know? And uh, different emotions can come and go. They feel extremely powerful, but they aren't really who we are. And that's a very, very big mistake that you know, most people make. And <clears throat> so the path I'm suggesting is a difficult one because feelings are incredibly powerful. And in fact, what Hasidic, the Hasidic movement of Chabad specifically wanted to bring about is to help people change the way they feel, to feel, actually start feeling emotions that were holy emotions. The idea was to do that through meditating about God's greatness. And then you start to feel differently inside about you know priorities and that affects how you feel but until then the choices is what counts and a person's strength of will to make good choices choices that follow god's will and that follow his moral code is what really makes who we are so Thank nancy you. i hope i your question. If not, I'm kind of worn out. I think that's the best I can do right <laughs> No, that's fine. Thank you. That was a, a very informative discussion of that paragraph. I'll let somebody else ask a question. Thank Timothy? you.
You're welcome. Timothy, can I help you? I was just going to say on page 174 in the second paragraph, the first two sentences there, they talk exactly about what this conversation is about. The intellect and body may prove to be unruly vehicles for the soul. The distress, passion, and predisposition of either can, can threaten to, or in fact, overwhelm the sovereignty which the soul, as it is sometimes called conscience, which is kind of what you was talking about with the voices, is supposed right. to possess. So, page one seventy four. You said, I'm sorry. Yeah. Page one seventy four. Yes, the second paragraph. Yeah. It pretty much lines up with everything you were saying, but I, what what I was pointing out was they used the word conscience instead of voices. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Timothy. I had read that far. It's funny because I was wondering whether we should actually study this or skip to the more practical portion um, of this chapter. I was actually debating debating that question of whether we should do this, those few pages, or skip to um, part three, I guess. Well, it's it's B, knowledge of God, get right to that, but maybe. Evidently, there's an interest. So, again, if uh, again to Nancy and everyone, the idea of reason needing a compass and values is page one seventy one, as he talks about pure reason. That is, has to acknowledge that its first principles origin outside itself. Yes. Um, so the thing is that a person is born <clears throat> when a person develops as a child the most powerful part of themselves is their feelings and and instincts and their mind is just developing and their soul really is, they're not really aware consciously of it, uh, which is the idea that it says in our sages that, you know, the good, the good um, inclination doesn't enter the person's body until maturity. So that means that it's hovering above, so to speak. They're, they're not, they're not um, identifiable in the person very much. I mean, the way we see this is children have very poor self-control and need to be um, habituated to have self-control. They don't naturally have it. They will lash out. If someone does something to them that you know angers them, they will just lash out. They will take what they want from other children, et cetera. So there's an element of what appears to be an evil inclination which means a self-centeredness and a centeredness that reason should assist their, you know, getting what their desires are. Now, this is important because a person has to learn how to sustain their body. And the way you do that is, is, is these desires are the body's way of, you know, messaging us until in terms of what it needs. So that had, that's part of the beginning is because the beginning of a person is developing the physical first and then the spiritual. First, you have to develop the ship before you put a captain on it. And so that's kind of the reason. And I could even, I, I personally believe that similarly is what's going on um, in the macro picture of the world is that humankind is rapidly advancing in technology, which is basically the body of society. 
how to take care of itself physically. And, and the soul has to be injected when we reach, when the body reaches maturity. Of course, it's supposed to be ed going through an educational process right now, all of society. And let's, and it, that's definitely the case, even though we may not be aware of it. So, and obviously the primary teachers supposed to be the Jewish people. Okay, um, anyone else has something? Well, Rabbi, doesn't, um, doesn't the soul have to have the intellect and the body in order to do what it is sent here to do? It can't function without a body and an intellect, correct? Correct. Now, you know, also, I think the, the soul has its own intellect also. Um, but it's not a physically oriented intellect. It's not a worldly oriented intellect. In other words, what I'm saying is that um, <clears throat> in the Garden of Eden, the souls comprehend and perceive revelations of God. So there is an element of thought or meditative process that the soul has also, but um, it doesn't relate to this to this world though. It needs to operate through the physical, the human, the, the lower spiritual levels, which are related to this world, and finally through the physical body, brain, etc., in order to you know work within the body and also to navigate in a physical world. So I think, I think an awareness that we have in a, sh a soul is extremely important. An awareness that there's a spiritual reality is also extremely important for us. And again, it's very opposite of the way the world has been moving over the generations towards an, a, a rejection of anything that we can't see. And um, while in reality, even, even the animal soul has things we can't see, like emotions. We can't define love or loyalty or even fear. You know, you can test how your blood pressure moves, but that doesn't really tell you anything. And even great ideas, about whether it's justice or, or um, maybe altruism, but also not things that are physical. <clears throat> anyway, we're heading towards the new year. And so we're heading towards a time in which the brain, you know, needs to follow and believe and integrate in itself the idea that, that there is a calculation and a judgment. And that even though it often maybe doesn't appear this way, but what our actions affect our lives. And that, you know, our merits will affect an outcome of a judgment about the future of and direction of our lives. Our sages say that on the new year, the wicked are immediately judged for death. And the righteous are immediately judged for life. The adjudication is right away, right away at, the, at night. So the question is, there are many wicked people that they don't die, they live out the year. In fact, they may flourish. 
police physically. So what does it mean that they're immediately, there is a judgment of death? And there are righteous people that suffer, some of them die. So what's the meaning of this statement? I believe that the deeper meaning is that the wicked are immediately judged that they will continue along their path. They'll immediately be led upon their, the path they're on away from God and towards ultimate death, which is complete disconnection from God and eventual annihilation. While the, while the righteous person, even though in this world there may be suffering or death here, but is heading towards the direction of life, which means to cleave to God and to cleave to the source of life and be given eternal life, even in the body eventually. So I think that's a deeper meaning there, obviously. I don't even know if there can really be another meaning because we all see that the simple meaning is not true. We all know it. And it couldn't be true because if it was true, there wouldn't be any free choice. So you can't, it cannot be read literally in terms of as we usually think the life and death meaning of this world. <clears throat> but nevertheless, despite that it seems unclear or very often, we have to believe that our actions you know, will have an effect. And we have to really live with it also. If we believe that, for example, giving char charity gives us life and will bless us, then we will be blessed. If we're cynical about it and we don't believe then we're not creating the right vessel to receive the blessing. Because in the end of the day, we're in charge of the ship. God gave it to us. In other words, our actions really direct things in an incredible way. And we make ourselves the receptors or not. So, So the point is, is we have to make the conscious choice, which is done through the mind. Mind is independent of the body, is able to make choices, um, although not always fully independent, depending on a person's, you know, how, how material and hedonistic they are. It may be extremely hard for the mind to make a choice and go against the body after many, many years of indulgence in different things, particularly in transgressions. Um, but in any event, it's even then it's still possible, but very difficult. So the point is, point is this week's parsha. What does this week's parsha teach us? Incredible lesson, which is a cosmic, monumental, basic lesson. And that is, you start off with a situation of person sees an attractive woman and he wants her, he desires her. In war, he sees her there, right? In war, the person has been shaken up by his experiences and his, his good, he's not been in the synagogue. He's been in war and he's experienced suffering. He's seen people, you know, crying out from their wounds. He himself has engaged in killing burning and acts of destruction. And so this puts him in a weak place. It was unavoidable. He had to, right? Maybe it was something that had to be done, but he's not in the house of study. He's not in the synagogue. And he responds maybe out of many different reasons in this way that he desires this woman. He takes her. And what does the Torah immediately say? that the, the best thing is stop. Stop right there. Don't engage with her. First, um, uh, I'll call it de-beautify her, shave her hair, so on, in order to, to dampen the desires for this woman. But nevertheless, they're married. And what happens is he eventually hates her. 
So we see, first of all, immediately we learn an, an incredible lesson. He was in love with her like crazy. He had to have her, right? And yet eventually he can't stand her. So again, it's the idea of we're not our feelings and our feelings change. We may feel one way, years later another way, which is why the divorce rate in the Western world is so high because people feel one way and a little later they feel differently. They don't feel the same anymore, even though those feelings are so strong, but it's like a flame. They flame up and then they burn out and then there's another flame and so on. It's not, it's not steady. <clears throat> but the point is the result of his actions creates a snowball of problems. He's hateful to this woman. And again, he's not a person who controlled himself. And he was, he, in fact, his relationship with this woman who basically dressed as a harlot. And so herself had her own self-interest involved when in during wartime, she was seeking to connect with one of the conquerors to seduce a conqueror. She herself is obviously a very self-centered person. Um, so this relationship has further tainted him. And, and, and because of that, you'd think that, that they should be together, but no, because self-centeredness in, in the end creates a wedge between people and he eventually hates her guts. This creates a bad situation between he and his children with this woman. And he wants to um, give his inheritance to a different wife but the Torah does not allow this and says that she's the first wife and her son, if she has the oldest son, has to get the birthright, whether you like it or not, whether you like her better or you don't like her better, doesn't matter. The law is blind and he is your first of your strength. He was the first child, male child, I guess. And he has to get the inheritance, even if you don't like him. Even if he is nice, doesn't matter. So again, the idea of choice over feelings, and even here in this case, it could be even legitimate, maybe even justified. Maybe he's a nasty firstborn, doesn't matter. He's probably quite rebellious because his father showed disdain for his mother. So you can imagine they're not in a very good relationship. So because of this, what happens to the son? The son is born out of a situation of desire between his father and his mother, and then discord and dislike. And what happens to him? He becomes a wayward son, so to speak. The ben sorer umare. He becomes the rebellious son who does what? Who is full, he's, he's, he can't control his desires, and he, he's, 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 he becomes a hedonist, he drinks, and as you know, and fills himself up on meat and whatever, steals his father's, his parents' property. So the point is there's a snowball effect and that a person's choices have long-term consequences. The choices that this person made during the wartime had a long-term effect going over tens and tens of years later, eventually, or at least 20 years or whatever it is, uh, well, something to that fact, but this young, this boy is uh, maybe just 13. He's not even 13 years old. He's just, a, he, he's just developing into puberty. So that means that the years have passed since he married this woman, right? So <clears throat> the point is, is that this is part of the judgment that we speak of. A mitzvah brings another mitzvah and, and a transgression brings another transgression, as Rashi springs there in the Chumash. <clears throat> if we do, and it's just, and this is something that has to do with Rosh Hashanah, has to do with the judgment of Rosh Hashanah, but it's also a judgment that we have every single day. And where we stand, every moment you could say we could be standing in trepidation. What are we going to do? Um, I don't want to put anybody on meds or anything like that here. But the point is just to be serious about life and that our choices could have a huge impact 
on future generations. Obviously, as a Jewish person, I've seen this in my own families, in my own nation. And I can't judge anyone, but I can say that the point is that the decisions parents make in how they live their lives and how they educate their children affects their children and who they marry and how they behave. And then the children's children, generations, generations to come. And that is a pretty heavy judgment. Okay. Um, oh, I got, we have some more people have been listening. <clears throat> so it's a time of introspection, as you all know, obviously. And every day really could be a time of introspection. And it shows, it, talk, it surely reflects how tr we need to try to be open with ourselves and, and, and take an honest look at our lives and what we're doing. And what can we improve? I think that's really the approach. What can we improve? What can we change for the better? How can we be less self-centered and yet happy? Anyway, it's a long discussion, but it has to do with something that I was going to talk about further in this book. And I'll leave you with this idea that when a person meditates on how we, God is such a loving and kind God, um, and that means honestly looking at the world and everything from A to Z of the universe and creation and how it's life-giving and how all our needs have been placed here on earth and we've been given the, the capacity physically and mentally to make use of everything here for our benefit. And while to such a, such a great extent, people are, are don't even you know recognize and say thank you to God for all of that. And yet he keeps giving. And so the idea of walking in God's ways, we can learn from this and try to refocus our attention instead of it being on us and what can we do to get richer, to get more fame. We can refocus on what can I do to, you know, um, help others? What can I do <clears throat> to follow more what God wants me to do? So I can be closer with him. But I believe the first part is harder. You know, thinking about others is even harder than, than thinking about yourself. But the point is, this puts it together because when the person knows that through helping others, they become closer to God, it becomes part and parcel of the same thing. And it's a lesson and insurance that the person should know you're not going to lose anything because through thinking of others, the person becomes more full of God in that way more whole. So, okay, there's a plenty more to say, but I guess that's it for now. Any questions? No, thank you, Rabbi. I really enjoyed having a Q&A time with you. Oh, thank you. I'm glad. Thank you very much. Okay, have a good evening, everyone. Lots to think about. Some of it, people, I'm sure you heard before, but it's worth thinking about again. And, um, oh, thank you very much. All right, everyone. Have a good night, and hopefully we'll be back on schedule next time. Good night. Laila Tov. Good night.